worship him. Hallelujah. 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 You're worthy, Lord Jesus. You're worthy, Lord Jesus. We worship you. Hallelujah. 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 Amen. Amen. All together wonderful. Has God been wonderful to you today? Amen. 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 I want to thank all of you for coming out today and thank those that are watching online and those that will watch later. I'm telling you, we're doing church in a whole new way today, folks. And it's exciting and it's it's encouraging and it's 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 hope filled. I um, w- was m- uh, meeting with a pastor friend of mine this week, and we, we're doing the way we we do meetings now. It was a it was a Zoom meeting, and he was telling us that the the gospel is being preached to more people today than ever before in the history of the world. And that's because of technology like Facebook Live and, and Zoom and and um, so many other platforms that are allowing the gospel to be broadcast. Folks that, that live in the neighborhood surrounding the church, they're hearing the message of the gospel, maybe for the first time, maybe for the first time in a long time. But let me tell you, church, God's word will not go out and then not come back. God is doing things in our community, touching people in our community, touching people around the world. And it's an exciting time to be part of the church. But it's also a time for us to do things, to to engage with the community, to be part of our community. So this morning I want to take just a a few minutes and and, and talk about this, this idea. This, this one sentence sermon, so to speak, and then I'm going to expound on it. And the main point is this. If you want to walk on water, you got to get out of the boat. If you want to walk on the water, you got to get out of the boat. When I was a um, sophomore in college, way, way back in the last century, when, when I went to school, you still had to take physical education classes in college. And uh, I, took, I took a few classes. I took bowling. Was not very good at that. Uh, I took racquetball. We played three-wall racquetball. I was terrible at that. Uh, we played some golf. And uh, I called mine uh, hide-and-seek. Because I could hit that ball a mile, but I had no clue where it was going. And then we'd spend the rest of the day looking for my golf ball. But my favorite PE class, my favorite, probably my favorite class of my entire academic career was sailing. We would go out on these little two-person sailboats that were called sunfishes. These little, just two, two of us. And uh, we'd sail all over this, this big, huge lake there on campus. And, man, we had, a, we had a blast. We would race, and sometimes we would capsize each other and run into each other. And, and uh, sometimes we'd run aground, and sometimes we'd fall out of the boat. And it was it was it was fun when you're 19 20 years old you know you don't understand the concept of danger so one day we're out and we're we're my buddy and I we're in our boat and we're we're racing these uh, this other boat these this uh, two young ladies and we're way past where we're supposed to go and the teacher's yelling at us to come back closer and we're, we're, we're way on the other side and out of nowhere this storm blows in. We, you know, Brunswick's right there on the, on the coast and so you get these storms that would just come out of nowhere and there's lightning and there's, there's thunder and wind and, and the next thing you know... We're turning and we're trying to get back to the, the part of the, the shore where, where the teacher was. And the, 
the girls, they're both camp sizes, cap sizes. So my buddy and I, we go over and we, we try to, to get up next to them and they're in the water and they're, they're, they're afraid and we're out of the water, but we're afraid. And, and so we, we both dive into the water and help the girls into our boat and then my buddy and I we, we flip our their boat back over and we lead them back into shore we were scared crazy scared teacher yelled at us threatened to flunk us for, for being too far out I learned a lot that day. I learned a great lesson, I think, that day. And, and that lesson is this. Sometimes we've got to face our fears. Sometimes we've got to embrace the adventure. Sometimes we've got to just jump out of the boat and, 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 and take the plunge. But for many of us, there, there are things that hold us back. So what, what holds you back? from risking it all to take the plunge for Jesus Christ? How do we overcome our fears? What do we do when we, when we doubt, when we have doubt in this next chapter of our life, this chapter that God is unveiling for us? What do we do when we have doubt? How do we keep our eyes focused on the goal? How do we keep our eyes focused on Jesus Christ when literally everything in the world is set out to distract us? The disciples faced a terrible storm in Matthew chapter 14. And I encourage you, normally this would be where I would read you a big section of that chapter. I encourage you today when you get home, read chapter 14 in Matthew. Read it, read it in a study Bible and look at the verses. I believe that Peter, in his experience in that chapter, can answer some of those questions that I just asked. And, and, and he shows us the way forward when he jumps out of the boat. You see, in this chapter, we read the great story of him walking on the water. And if, if you look closely enough, you can see there are some things that he did that should encourage us today to do like him Sorry. and jump out of the boat. I think it's interesting when, when it comes to Peter. A lot of times we'll condemn him and we'll say, listen, even Jesus said, man, he was a man of little faith. If Peter was a man of little faith, what about the other 11? They didn't get out of the boat at all. They were people of no faith. So before we criticize someone else for what they've done and what they're trying to do, let's take a good hard look at ourselves and say, Lord, am I a person of faith? Am I a man of faith, a, a woman of faith? Am I living a faith-filled life? I, uh, most of you guys know I love sports. I love football and baseball and basketball and I like to play, I like to watch, I like to participate. Andrea will get frustrated. She'll, she'll say, are you watching the part of the show where they talk about the game? Are you watching the game? Are you watching the thing where they're talking about the game you just watched? I'm like, yeah, I'm watching all that. And in that post-game conversation, you get all the Monday morning quarterbacking. Well, you know what they should have done here on this play is gone deep. Or, oh, they should have brought in the left-handed reliever instead of the right-handed reliever. Let me tell you, folks, a lot of times we're like that about our fellow brothers and sisters. Oh, if I had been in their position, this is what I would have done. It's one thing to stand and criticize your brothers and sisters. It's another thing to stand in the pocket and take the hit. 
Church, we got to be willing to stand up with our brothers and sisters, willing to, to stand there with them, not to criticize, but to lift up and encourage. So when it comes to trusting Jesus, what keeps us from getting out of the boat? What keeps you from, from daring to trust? I think there's about three reasons, three things we can learn from Peter in this. And the first one is this. You know, when the disciples first see Jesus coming along the water, they mistake him for a ghost. Now think about this. Get this image in your, in your mind. They've been battling this storm all night. They've been afraid for hours and hours and hours. And now they look over the mist and they see this shadowy figure walking toward them. And, and they scream, it's a ghost. In their mind, things have gone from bad to worse to worser. That's a good South Georgia word there, worser. They see him as a ghost. So the first thing we've got to do to be able to get out of the boat is to dispel the delusions that we conjure up in our own mind. We try to make things worse than they really are. We, we try to anticipate the most horrific outcome. And use that as arguing grounds with God. Lord, I can't do that because there's ghosts. I like watching old movies, old suspenseful movies. Those movies are great because those directors, they don't always show you the action. As, as a matter of fact, they rarely do. They, they build up this suspenseful scene and, and they know that your mind will create something worse than what they could have put on screen. And that's how it is. We, 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 we start trying to fill in the blanks and the disciples were fill, filling in these blanks and when they see this shadowy figure on the water walking toward them, the only thing that they can think of is it's a ghost. Now before we beat up on the disciples, stop and say, would I have done that? Yeah, I think so. I would have. How often do we make our fears greater than they really are? How often are we afraid to answer the phone or to have a conversation or, or to be a part of something because we're afraid? The only way to beat that fear, the only way to overcome that spiritual fear is to really know who Jesus Christ is. I found this really interesting. Down in my hometown, Brunswick, Georgia, uh, there's a, a place called Fletsy or Fleet Tech, the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. I train a lot of border security guys, Justice Department guys, a lot, a lot of folks down there go for training. And I found this out that, that they train federal agents, special agents, they train them on how to identify a counterfeit bill, counterfeit money. And the way they train them is really interesting. They put them in a room for days and days and days and have them count real money. They, they, they spend hours counting real dollars, real 20s, real 50s, real 100s. Why do they do it that way? Why, why do they do that? Then they'll slip in a phony bill. And the vast majority of the time, the agents catch the, the, the fake money. Why is that? It's not because they've spent so much time training to identify the counterfeit. It's because they've spent so much time with the real deal, they can spot the fake. Let me tell you, church, this is what we need to do. We need to be so familiar with Jesus that when these false prophets, these false preachers, these 
pseudo uh, saviors show up that we can spot them for who they are and we can say listen that's not real that's not who Jesus is we need to know Jesus we need to know him in the deepest most personal sense only through a personal relationship with him can we recognize who he is and what he is. Only as we grow deeper and deeper and deeper in Christ will we be able to identify the fakes and the phonies that seem to be popping up on every corner today. The disciples, they mistake Jesus for a ghost. But then, then Peter, only Peter is sure that that's Jesus walking on the water. And then he dares to move toward Christ. So this morning, whether you're here in the parking lot or listening somewhere else, how is your relationship with Jesus Christ? Is he your savior? Is, is he your Lord and Lord of all? Is, is he your friend that sticks closer than a brother? I'm sure everybody here today and everybody listening could identify the president of the United States if he pulled into our parking lot today. We'd be able to point at him and say, that's the president. The question is, though, would he know who you are? I've never met him. He wouldn't know me. But let me tell you, Jesus Christ knows me and knows me by name. You see, that's the kind of relationship you got to have with Christ. One where he knows you and you know him and it's real and it's intimate and it's deep. You got to have that relationship before you can get out of the boat. When Peter gets out of the boat, he's focused on Christ. He's, he's focused on the source of his power. And then Peter does what we all do. He shifts his focus from the source of his power to the problems surrounding him. Every one of us will sink. Every one of us will sink if we get distracted from Jesus. You understand that? All of us will sink if we don't focus on Jesus Christ. Now, I think that there are ways that distractions come into our life, two different ways. There's, there's obvious distractions, and then there's subtle distractions. I think Peter gets distracted by the obvious stuff. You know, you're, you're gingerly walking on the water, and boom, the lightning flashes right next to you and the thunder rolls and the waves come. I think it would be easy in that moment to go, you know what? Peter got distracted. There's a storm brewing all around him. He's afraid. I mean, think about that. Just a few moments ago, he's hiding in the boat and now he's literally exposed in the middle of the storm. It's natural to get scared of things that look like they can overtake us. But we've got to stay focused on Jesus Christ. When we choose to focus on our problems, rather on the source of our power, we, we literally sacrifice our connection with Jesus. We, uh, we were watching something on... Uh, one of the channels the other night and our internet went down and man you would have thought we were a third world country I mean the girls were all upset oh lord dad it's the end of the world is this what the rapture is going to look like no internet no 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 we've just lost connection 
We need to go back, reboot, and we'll get the connection back again. When our problems distract us from Jesus, we, we need to turn <coughs> to him again. We need to turn back to him. John 1, uh, 1 John chapter 4, verse 4 says, The one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. If we focus on the problems, then we will lose sight of the one that is greater than anything. Andrea spoke about that earlier. We can also get distracted by subtle things. It is, it is a rare week that I don't get a phone call from somebody wanting me to be a part of something. Hey, Pastor, we're putting this group together and we, we're going to march on Harrisburg for this or we're going to go do this or, or we, we want to come be a part of this and we want you to, to be involved in this. And so many of them are good things. So many of them are even right things. But listen, church, the more things that you commit yourself to like that, you've got to be careful that they don't distract you from Jesus Christ. We can get so caught up in doing good that we forget the source of all good. So I tend to ask myself a couple questions. One is, is this, is this going to help the kingdom of God advance? So it's going to help us win the lost and disciple the found. If the answer is no to either of those questions, I'm going to say no. Because my calling, my, 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 my ministry, my, my direction, the thing God has called me into is to do that, to win the lost and disciple the found. And while there are so many things I'd love to be a part of, if they're not focusing in on that then they're taking away from doing what God has called me to do. So look at the things in your life. What things that you're a part of. Has God called you to that? In Luke chapter 9 verse 51 we read, When the days are coming were coming to a close for him he, to be taken up, he was determined to journey to Jerusalem. See, Jesus knew that he was heading to that cross. He, he, he knew that that was his life's mission. He knew that that was his calling. The truth is that he lived beyond 33. He could have healed more people. He could have preached to more people. He could have taught. He could have converted more people. If he had delayed going to the cross for five years or ten years, what more could he have accomplished here on earth? See, all of those were good things, but they were not his purpose. They weren't why he came to earth. He came to earth to die on a cross to save us from our sins. Jesus maintained that single focus. He maintained the focus on the cross. He, he wasn't going to be distracted by obvious problems. He, he, the Pharisees and the scribes and, and, and the opposition, he, he, he wasn't going to be uh, distracted by the, the subtle issues, healing and teaching and preaching. He focused on the cross. He focused on you and he focused on me. We can't let the problems of this world distract us from the source of our power. Distract us from Jesus Christ. This is the last thing. When Peter got back into the boat, the disciples worshipped Jesus. When you really read the text there, you, you, you start to understand that this kind of worship that they experienced with Christ on this day was different. And what's so amazing about that to me is this wasn't a first time event for these guys. This wasn't the first time that Jesus had rescued them from a storm. A few chapters earlier, Matthew chapter 8, they're, they're in a storm and Jesus is in the bottom of the boat sleeping. Sound familiar? The waves and the thunder and the lightning. And, and they're, they're 
they're so scared they just know that they're going to die. And, and so instead of walking on the water, Jesus comes up from the bottom of the boat. And Jesus turns and he speaks to the, the wind and he speaks to the, the waves and he calms the storm. And the disciples, they turn and they look at each other. And then they say, what kind of man is this that even the winds obey his command? What kind of man is this? This time, when Jesus comes walking across the water and gets in the boat with him, they say, surely he must be the son of God. So how did they go from what kind of man is this to you're the son of God? Something about that experience, it, it opened their eyes, it, it opened their hearts. Before this encounter, Jesus was just an amazing guy, an amazing dude. But now the disciples understood and they saw him as the Messiah, as the, the son of God. So church today, right now, right where you are, how can we see Jesus for who he really is? How can we move from seeing him as just some great man, some great teacher, some, some great philosopher? How can we move from that to seeing that he is the only one that can save us? He is the only one that can heal us. He is the only one that can change our lives forever. Church, we got to spend time with him. I say that so often, and it really is that simple. It really is that simple, but sometimes the most obvious things are the things that we fail to see. To know Jesus, I've got to spend time with Jesus. I've got to hear his voice and he has to hear my voice and, and I have to read his word. But we have a problem sometimes that when these storms blow in and, and, and they rage across our life, Jesus isn't always the first person we call on. Jesus isn't the one that we reach out to and we say, Lord, I need you to come. We'll call our friends. We'll call our family. We'll, 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 we'll go tell the neighbor. We'll, we'll, we'll search our own intellect and we'll, 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 we'll try to figure it out on our own. And the whole time Jesus is standing there saying, call to me. I'm right here. I'm right here. Call to me. Church, when we look to ourselves or somebody else for the answer instead of Jesus Christ, we have a doubt problem. We have a doubting problem. This is the, the heavy part of the, the deal here. If we turn to him as a last resort, resort we're trying to put him on a time limit. We're trying to, to use him as an ATM machine. And, and listen, if Christ doesn't handle our problem within just a few seconds, We're going to turn somewhere else. We're going to get mad at the church. We're going to get mad at the pastor. We're going to get mad at the praise team. We're going to get mad at everybody else. Get mad at Jesus. Can I say this to you with love? Not only must Christ be our first choice, Christ must be our only choice. Our commitment to him must be unwavering. Now, I'm confident that somebody is thinking this right now. But pastor, what happens if Jesus doesn't help? 
What if Jesus doesn't respond the way that I want him to? What if he doesn't do what I want him to do? Or, or what, what, if he doesn't, what if he doesn't follow my directions? You ever done that? Lord, have your way, and this is how I want you to have your way. Jesus is all-powerful. Jesus is all-knowing. And Jesus will help you. Now, this is part of the story that we sometimes gloss over and, and we miss when we just read through chapter 14 really quickly. Jesus got into the boat, but the storm didn't end the second he got into the boat. Sometimes God's plan for us is to trust him through the storm. Not to just come and end the storm or end the battle or end the fight, but to put our trust in him to say, you know what, God, whether the storm ends today, tomorrow, or 10 years from now, my trust is in you and it will not waver. You are my God. You are my Savior. You are my healer. I am with you. As the kids would say today, it's ride or die, God. I'm going to ride with you. I'm going to die with you. I'm yours. See, that's where our trust and our, our faith have to come in. Our life is built on Jesus and, and him alone. Him alone, not, not Jesus and something else, not, not, not the church and something else. It's, it's Jesus Christ all the way. No doubts in his ability, no, no question in, in him, no, no, no question of following him as the right choice, no wondering and doubting whether Christ can. This is the moment that the disciples find themselves here in that boat, in the middle of the storm, Jesus in their boat. They have come into the presence of Jesus and they lose sight of the storm and they're just focused on Jesus. They have seen him do the incredible. That ended their disillusionment. They saw him defeat the distractions. They, they, he destroyed the doubts. That's what we need him to do in our lives. We need to know Christ personally. We need to stay focused on him. And we need to trust him with all. When we do those three things, when we, when we sell out to Christ that way Jesus will come to us and he will say come out of the boat come out of the boat the great philosopher Kierkegaard he, he called the decision to follow Jesus a great leap of faith a great leap of faith like leaping off of a cliff or diving out of a boat. Church, now's not the time for us to play it safe. Now's the time for us to be bold in our faith. Now's the time for us to dive in and say, Lord, I'm with you. I believe with all my heart that we're living in the last days. I believe with all my heart that the rapture is imminent. I believe with all of my heart we're going to hear a trumpet sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and that those that remain will be caught up in glory with him. Now is the time for us to be bold and to share our faith, share our gospel with the, the people that are around us. So I want to close with this. Go ahead and start some music there, Steve. Are there some fears in your life that cause you to be disillusioned and, and, and 
will stop you from risking it all for Christ. Could it be that those fears aren't as big as you think they are? Could it be that you've let them play up in your mind and now you need to give them over to God? Are there some problems in your life that are, that are causing you to be distracted, to, to get your focus off of Christ? To, to get your focus off of the cross? Do you hear these voids of doubt picking at you and nagging at you and pushing against you? to keep you from trusting Christ. Whatever it is, whatever you're facing this morning, I want to tell you this. Jesus is the one that is greater than our fears. Jesus is greater than our problems. And Jesus is greater than any doubts we might have. He is waiting on you to believe in him and risk it all. to leave the boat and walk on the water. So I'm going to ask you to do this with me this morning. We're going to close in prayer and we're going to do it a little different. There's plenty of room in our parking lot. I'm going to ask everybody to get out of your car. Just spread out. And we're going to lift our voice and we're going to pray the Lord. Take just a minute. Get out of your car. Spread out. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Let's go to the Lord in prayer right now. Dear Heavenly Father. Oh, Lord, forgive us of those times that we've been too afraid. Forgive us of those times that we've been disillusioned, distracted. Forgive us of those times, Lord, that we've just not heard it right. We've not gotten it right. We've been afraid to do it. And Lord, right now, I pray that you will once again call your church out of the boat, call us from the sidelines, call us out and put us into the, the, the game, Lord Jesus. Put us into this world so that we can be a beacon of hope, a beacon of salvation, a place of healing, Lord Jesus. I pray right now, Lord, that you will just unleash the power of the Holy Spirit upon your people. Let your sons and your daughters dream dreams and see visions. Let the gifts of the Spirit be active. Lord, let us prophesy. Let us speak in tongues. Let us have words of knowledge, wisdom. Lord, I pray that you will encourage your people today. Go with them as they go through their week this week. Lord, bless them as they, they go about their jobs, go about their days, go about their lives. Lord, give us divine opportunities to witness for you. Bring us back together at that appointed time. In your holy, holy, holy name we pray. And the church said, Amen, Amen. God bless you. Remember Tuesday night at 630 for Bible school and then all of our Wednesday night programming. I love you. God loves you. Have a great week.